Sweet. Good morning. You guys doing all right? Holy smokes. We are on, we are on Thanksgiving break if you're in college. No, nobody, nobody's like, woo, that's awesome. That's great. You guys doing okay? There's kind of an energy buzz. There's kind of a buzz going on in the room today. Super excited about that. If we haven't met yet, I'm Paul, and pastor of the Downtown Vineyard Church, and we are in a series we're calling Fool, and I'm super excited about this talk. And you know why I'm super excited about this talk? Because I have two talks inside one talk. I know you guys aren't excited, but I'm super excited. That's like double bubble. Do you guys remember double bubble when you could like blow two bubbles inside of your bubble? Come on. Am I the only one? Yeah, double bubble. You could, when you're in seventh grade and you want to find out how cool you are, you can finally, you can blow a bubble inside of another bubble. Not that I think that two sermons in one sermon is cool, but we'll see. It's going to be good. If you're here for the first time, I'm Paul. And uh, anyway, I'm ready to worship with you. Uh, uh, super excited about today's worship set and our team and children's ministry and youth ministries going um, if you're here for the first time, you're going to see people have already started lighting candles, and candles is just a practice that we instituted a few years ago in our church that's just a symbol of a prayer you're praying. Now, sometimes you can pray that from your seats, you can pray that from wherever, but there's just really something that's really kind of meaningful when you can get out of your seat and just be like, hey, you know what, Lord, this is my prayer that I'm praying. This is my prayer that I'm praying. So when I see these candles, they actually moves my heart every time to know that we've already had people walk into the room and just say, really, in some ways, because these candles have already been lit, these are actually people saying, God, would you meet me in this space today? Like, right? Like this kind of, a, kind of, they've already came up, they've already lit a candle, which means they've already said, hey, God, would you meet me in this space today? Lord, Lord would you hear my prayers and hear what's going on in my life? I think that's something we could all agree with, that we'd all come together this morning and say, hey, God, would you meet us in this space today? Today during service, you're going to see people get out of their um, seats uh, as the worship team's leading us in worship, and you'll see people taking communion maybe by themselves or maybe with their family or maybe with a friend. It's, it's, a, it's a practice for us that we really want the service to be set up in such a way that we move towards Jesus spiritually, that, that we let God speak to us. But we literally are sitting aside the next hour, hour and 15 minutes to just say, God, we want to experience you. We want to, we want to experience your presence. Would you move in our lives and as we lay down our lives? And so you'll have people taking communion. You know, communion is literally Jesus instituted it with his disciples right before he was crucified. And he said, as often as you get together, let's do this. Do this in remembrance of me. And it, it's the remembrance that Jesus gave us his life. He also gave us his death, and he gave us his resurrection, right? And it's because of his resurrection that I don't know if you realize this, but a Christian practice is that when he was celebrating Sabbath, he, they celebrated Sabbath on Saturday, but as Christians, we celebrate on Sunday. And it's because every Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. And so as after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples started celebrating on Sunday, and the reason they're celebrating on Sunday is because we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday. That's why churches gather on Sunday. We celebrate the resurrection of Christ every Sunday. And then you have people that are giving their tithes and their offerings, and those are the black boxes. And you can give it here in, in the room, or you can give it online, or you can give it through your bank. We don't actually have ushers. And, and we went away from ushers a long time ago. And the reason we went away from ushers is because just as I think these candles are a sacred way of saying, hey, Lord, would you hear my prayers? And just as I think that um, communion is a way of saying, Lord, thank you for your life, your death, and your resurrection, like, we want to give our offering, not have the offering taken. Does that make sense? Like, tithing and giving is a sacred act. And it's, it's a way that we prioritize our life and the things that God gives us. And we give them back to the Lord and just say, Lord, would you use these resources for your kingdom? And so we believe that tithing and offering is sacred. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship. We're going to sing these songs. And we're not doing karaoke, right? We're, we're singing to the Lord. So for the next, 30, the next three, four songs, you're going to hear us. And we're going to sing these songs. The words will be on the screen. And it literally is for the next 15, 20 minutes is a heart cry of like, Lord, we want you to know that we love you. And we want you to hear these songs. And we want to praise your name. 
And so, anyway, let's stand together and I'm going to pray us in. And so, Lord, we love you. And we're just coming before you. And we just say, come Holy Spirit. Come enter this room and be present, Lord, in such a way that we would sense you moving on our lives and that you'd be speaking to us and guiding us and leading us and directing us. Lord, we love you. Thank you that this week we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving and that we would even begin to just think of all the things we're thankful for. And maybe one of those would be our relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus. Come into this room. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers soul anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are as we claim your victory. Let it rise, let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation, cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 we praise you. Oh, 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 let faith be a song that overcomes raging sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Eyes, let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 oh we praise you. Oh. oh This is what heaven looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. Oh, we praise you.
Expectation of the God of our salvation is among us. Moving for a foundation, need to fear, no need for hesitation.
Good morning. Happy Good morning, Thanksgiving guys. week. If it's your if Thanksgiving is your favorite holiday, give it up. Anybody? Love some yeah, love Thanksgiving and there's some Thanksgiving happenings that I'll share in just a minute, but hello to our online community joining us that way and take it away. Yeah, welcome everybody. We're so glad you're here with us physically and online. Um, it's just so fun to be together with everybody worshiping and all the fun stuff. So we're going to get business out of the way real quick first. We always love to do our Connect card. If it's your first time here, um, you'll see stickers on the pews, the QR codes that you can scan. And that's really just our way of finding out who um, we can connect with, who we're doing church with. Um, it's a great place to enter um, or ask for prayer. Our, our leaders and pastors pray for 
all the prayer requests that you submit each week. It's a great way to lift up praise. We love to celebrate with you also. So if you can um, either do that or go to dtvchurch.org, there's a link, or on our DTV app, those are some ways that you can fill out the Connect card. A few Thanksgiving and Christmas happenings. So number one, the angel tree that you'll see out there with the tags on it. So we partner to bless Chapita Elementary. Last year we blessed over 100 kids with something a little extra special at Christmas time. So we still need some more gift givers. So you can grab a tag out there, bless a child, bring that gift back wrapped along with the tag by December the 10th. Next we have Give Thanks Night, which is a Grand Valley vineyard wide uh, opportunities to just to give thanks. So um, vineyard worship leaders from around the valley will be gathering at Canyon View Vineyard tonight from 6 to 730 just for an opportunity to say thanks God for all the great things you do in our lives and in our uh, community. And then thirdly, Thanksgiving together will be happening this Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, uh, basically preparing food and delivering food to families who could use a little extra boost this uh, Thanksgiving and we're a little light in some areas and Paul gave you the sticky note. To yeah, so I just that. want to bring you guys up to speed. So we need, we need a lot of food actually. I'm not going to do the math. So we have four of 15 um, dishes of mashed potatoes. So we need more potatoes. Um, we have seven of the 30 turkeys that we need. We have 11 of the 15 servings of stuffing, only six of the 25 um, packages of rolls, I guess, and then only 11 of the 50 pies that we need. So if you're in a place that you can help bless extra this season, um, we would love for you to get a hold of us for that. And in just a minute, there'll be a video with more info on that as well. Yeah, and last, guys, we'll be hanging out in the start here corner in the back corner of the auditorium. If you're new or this is your first time, we'd love to meet you. Um, if it's your first time, we have something fun and free for you. Or if you just want to learn more about how you can get involved at DTV, we can help you do that, too. So yep. check out Have a great video. Sunday and enjoy Thanks, the video. Guys. Sounds. Friends, I hope you're doing well. Hey, listen, um, I'm sitting outside my house, and so you're going to hear some downtown sounds and cars kind of going by and making some noise, but this is where I live, and I love my neighborhood, and I love this valley. This year, we're doing something that Lene and I are super excited about. It's called Thanksgiving Together. What we're doing is we're getting together with the other vineyard churches in the valley, and we're going to try and feed a 1,000 families on November 22nd. So here's how it works from our end. If you're a part of the Downtown Vineyard Church or you're part of Vineyard Community Church, then what we're asking you is to go onto our website, onto the events page on our website, find the uh, event, Thanksgiving Together, and then click on that. Once you click on that, you'll be able to go to a list where there'll be a list of things that you could provide to help us feed a thousand families. We're looking for 30 people in our church who would be willing to make a turkey. Um, and you, you, you bake the turkey and then you take it to Canyon View Vineyard Church on November 22nd that morning. And then you can also find uh, how many people we need to prepare 10 pounds of mashed potatoes, stuffing, all of the things. They're all there. Anyway, I believe that we're better together and Thanksgiving together is a great way to come together. So I hope you're doing great. I hope you'll participate with us in this. This is a real exciting thing. It'll do a couple things. It'll feed people in our valley that need some help this year. The other thing that it'll do is it'll build community across the vineyard churches across this valley, which I just always love. I love our vineyard family. God bless you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. All right. Good morning. Good morning. I watched something happen just a few minutes ago, and I was like, mm, we need to do that a little bit better. So, uh, and it wasn't the video. It was, uh, would you just turn around and say hi to somebody? It was like, hey, how's it going? And you just said, no, kept like, stand up, like, say hi to somebody, like, really greet them. Yeah. Invite somebody to lunch. 
I don't know. I mean, all the things, right? It, we're, 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 we're really, we've been, in this, we've been in this series called Thank For or Fool. And it's so funny that sometimes we come to church and we just get in our own little bubble. And I said it last week, church was not meant, church was never meant to be in rows. Church was always meant to be in community. And so one of the goals that were going to happen, yeah, amen. So uh, church was meant to be in community. I've got a couple things I want to let you know about. Before I get into my talk, I'm going to be in Philippians chapter 3 in just a minute. And today is called Faithful. We're going to talk about the faithfulness that God has given us and how in return our faithfulness returns uh, back to Him. And so we're going to, that's what we're going to talk about in just a second. But I've got like about four or five things that I want to tell you about. First of all, um, I need to let you know that this week, this week, our children's pastor, Jenna, Jenna DeRolbert, she's been our children's pastor, we hired her back in March, March 1st was her first day, she resigned on Tuesday. And so there's kind of a moment where we wasn't necessarily expecting that. However, her and her husband, they're looking to relocate outside the valley. And she let me know that uh, her last day was Tuesday. And so in that space, there's another place that I'm like very excited about. Linnea and Jackie Stauffer will be heading up our children's ministry team for uh, the interim. And we're excited about that. We've already had a couple extra people volunteer. And so if you're in the room and you've said, hey, I want to volunteer in children's ministry, it's a really good time to get in. Really good time to get in. The second one that we're doing this morning is this. The second thing that's happened in this um, is that we are, we, the executive team and the board met this past week. We are going to be closing our Vineyard Community Campus, and that team's going to be coming and rejoining us here. And here's what's kind of exciting about that. When we took on that campus, that the very first service we had was less than 10 people were in it. Right now, there's about 50 people that are going to that campus. That's exciting. Kevin and Missy have done a, like, an amazing job with Vineyard Community Church. And the interesting part is, is that when we took on that campus, it was just really struggling. It has never found sustainability. And so we had a conversation last week with their leadership team, we talked with our board the week before that, and then we talked with our executive team last week. And all of us were in agreement that this is a, the, the right move. Here's what we're excited about. We've had over 50 conversations this week. They are all excited to come join us here at DTV. So instead of having two roofs, we'll be one church under one roof, and we're excited to have that team back, and we're excited for all the people who have discovered the downtown Vineyard Church through Vineyard Community Church. They've done an excellent job. And so that, their last service will be uh, December 24th at 10 a.m., and then they will join us for Christmas Eve service. Uh, we will be hosting, we will be hosting two more things, three more things. We will be hosting a 10 a.m. service Christmas Eve, or Christmas morning, and we will be hosting a Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. And so we're going to have our normal, because it's, uh, Christmas Eve is Sunday, we're going to have our normal 10 a.m. service. It's going to kind of be a light worship um, acoustic set, uh, a candle lighting service, and then we're going to do a big worship set on Christmas Eve. And so 10 a.m. normal service, kids ministry uh, will be in service, and then we are starting a, a couple new things that are going to be happening. Um, Tuesday, the 28th of November, I've got a, a, a gentleman in our church, Clint Latham. He's been coming for a few months. He said, I want to start a men's group. He's going to start a new men's group that's going to launch November 28th at Base Camp Brewery. And it's gonna, he's calling it Brotherhood. So any guys that are looking to get involved in uh, our, our men's ministry, it's a good thing to get a hold of. And then going into Genesis, or going into, um, going into January... I'm going to start a new series. <laughs> I'm going to start a new series. And here's something I haven't done for a while. Um, I think last year I did the book of Revelation. Starting in January, I'm going to start the book of Genesis. And we're going to be in Genesis for the entire year. That's, we're just going to do a big deep dive into the book of Genesis. We're going to talk about the beginning and God's relationship with man. And so you were intended to have a relationship with God. And Genesis really sets up a really good conversation for that. And so here we go. So now we're going to be, um, we're going to move towards our talk today. So here's where we've been at. This series that I've been in is out of the book of Philippians. Uh, Philippians 1, Philippians 2, Philippians 3, Philippians 4. Uh, this week is Philippians chapter 3. And we started this series off 
by asking this question. And the question really is, is that what is a Christian supposed to be full of? That when you have a relationship with Jesus, Jesus says that I've come that you might have life and have it to the full, John 10, 10. He's saying that there should be this full life that takes place in a Christian's life. It should, right? It should. It should be the space for Christians that you just, you experience the fullness of what God was intending in your life. And so we talked about the very first Philippians chapter 1 was about thankfulness. And that, that literally we said that you will only ever be as happy as your relationships are healthy. Isn't it a weird thing in this life that oftentimes, like it from the outward appearance, it can look like everything's going great. You can be driving the night, you can be driving the nice car, you can have a nice house, you can have all of those things. And literally, because your relationships are a wreck, and God created us for relationship, both with Him and with others, that if your relationships are a wreck, it doesn't matter what house you're living in or what car you're driving. I oftentimes, I get to travel, uh, a couple times a year I get to travel somewhere to Central America usually, uh, El Salvador, Guatemala, I've been to Panama. And it's so interesting, you can go into places where the average wage is $1.50 an hour a day, where, where poverty is like the norm. And you walk into those spaces and the joy and the happiness is through the roof. Because they may not have a lot of money, but they have really healthy, good relationships. And so that was the very first talk that Paul starts off in the book of Philippians, and he's just thanking God for the church of Philippi. Like he's thanking God for the church of Philippi. Like they're generous and they're kind and they take care of him. And they love him and they support him. And there's this space that he's literally in a Roman jail at the time that he writes the book of uh, the, the letter to the Philippian church, he's, he's handcuffed to a jailer for most of his day. And even in that space, he says, I am filled with joy. You see, it's not your circumstances that determine your joy. It's your relationships. It's your relationships. And so then we turned and we said, well, last week we talked about gratitude. And Thankfulness, thankfulness is an external feeling that happens when something happens to you. That thankfulness is this external thing that we respond to. Somebody, somebody does something nice for you and it causes you and you go, I'm, I'm super thankful. Maybe this week you're thankful that you're going to have family in town. I said maybe. That was maybe. Maybe you're thankful this year that somebody else is making the turkey and somebody else is baking the pies, right? Like you're just feeling all this thankfulness. So like, thank you. you. Yes, no, I'd love for you to make the turkey. And some of you might even be really thankful when your family goes home. You'll feel this thankfulness. <laughs> it's things that happen outside of you that you're responding to. And then we said this. We said gratitude is actually something that resides inside of you. So thankfulness happens outside of you, and gratitude is the thing that happens inside you. That it's, it's a, a, a space where we're thankful for God's goodness. It doesn't matter what is going on in our circumstances. Our circumstances may feel out of control, but you still are sitting in this space, and you're grateful. You're grateful for all that God's done in your life. Uh, I have a friend who, who was diagnosed with a, a, a sickness here in the past um, couple months. And I got to have a conversation with him this week. And he said, I am so grateful. I'm so grateful for all that God has blessed me with in this life. And you, you realize that his circumstances isn't deciding what's going on inside his heart. Like, gratitude comes from inside. David said this in Psalms 100 verse 5. I read this to you last week. He said, for the Lord is always good. I don't know if you've ever read anything about David's life. David's life wasn't always good. Like his circumstances changed left and right, left and right. He was betrayed over and over and over and over. He found himself on the run. He, uh, King Saul kept trying to kill him. And he, he had been, uh, his wife left him and his sons uh, rebelled against him. And yet, David writes in Psalms 100, he says, for the Lord is always good. 
He's always loving. He's always kind. And his faithfulness goes on and on and on to each succeeding generation. You see, so today what we're going to talk about is this. We're going to talk about the benefits of faith. Isn't faith an interesting thing? Like when you really think about it, faith's an interesting thing. Hebrews, the author of Hebrews says it's something we can't even see. That we believe in something that we can't see. And that we have faith for it. And the benefits of being full of faith. Like when somebody's full of faith and you can't dissuade them and, and they just stand firm in their faith. And that faithfulness leads to the life of the faithful. Let's read Philippians chapter 3 together. I'm going to read down to verse 14. It says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He says, I never get tired of telling you these things. I do it to safeguard your faith. I mean, let me just pause right there. This is not the second part of the sermon that I promised you. But it could, easily could be. Right? Like just, he's like in jail, and he says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He goes on to say in verse 2, he says, watch out for those dogs, those people who do, who, who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. We'll talk about that. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Although I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. He says, I was circumcised um, on the eighth day. I'm a pure-blood citizen of Israel and members of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew of Hebrews, there ever, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church, and as for righteousness, I obeyed the rules without fault. You ever known somebody like that? They, there's a song called Goody Two Shoes. I'm sorry. I'm actually not too sorry, but he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I became righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him. I want to share with his death. So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Then he goes on to say this in verse 12, 13, and 14. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection which Christ Jesus first possessed for me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on the one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us home. You see, I, I love this passage. It, it's, it's Paul, and what he's doing is he's literally, he's saying that like, hey man, don't give up. Like, don't give up. Like, your faith is so important to your faithfulness. Let me give you, I'm going to give you five ways that your faith impacts your faithfulness. First, it impacts your faithfulness because faith sets us free from worry. He opens it up and he says, whatever happens. I, I love that he opens up with whatever happens. Have, have you ever known somebody that like, it doesn't matter what happens, you can look at it and you're like, your house is burning down. One of my favorite uh, Bible teachers from the 1700s, I'm spacing out his name right now, his church started to burn. 
and they burned, and they went and they found him, and they said, Pastor, you got to come. you got to come. The church is on fire. And he comes, and sure enough, his church is on fire. And as he's sitting there, he just has this big smile on his face, and his friends look at him and said, What are you smiling about? He goes, Oh, I pray that the church would burn so bright that it would gather people like these that they would come see the brightness of Jesus. He's like, this is what the church is supposed to be. The church is supposed to be a place that's so on fire that people come all around to see what the goodness is. You see, when Paul says whatever, he's literally in jail. He's tied to a jailer, and he's like, whatever. People are like, but Paul, you know you're in prison. He goes, yeah, but I'm getting to preach the gospel to this guy. I got a captive audience. Like, but, but Paul, you know you could die. It's like, yeah, whatever. To die is gain. But Paul, you know that they will beat you. Yeah, whatever. And when they do, I'm going to get to preach the gospel to them. Right? Like, there's this space for Paul. Then when Paul writes the words whatever, he's literally saying, you do understand that my faith in Jesus has set me free from worry. Now, I, I know that most people don't walk in that. But this is what we're talking about. Faithful people should lead to a faith that sets them free from worry. Because whatever happens, whatever happens, happens dot 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 don't you know that god's gonna work it out like whatever happens come on how many of you guys have had an experience right now i'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a buddy of mine and his experience how many of you have ever had an experience that you wouldn't wish that wish that on your worst enemy and yet now that you're past that experience you thank god for what god did for you in that season yeah yeah because whatever happens God's going to work it out for the good of those that are in Christ Jesus. Like, like, faithfulness leads to faith that leads to the freedom of worry. It's amazing to me how many things we worry about. We wake up the other day. I've got a friend of mine, Mark. We played golf together the other day, and we were worried about the weather. And we totally overdressed for the game. Right? Like, like, we worry about the weather. We worry about what people think of us. And you do realize that you worry about what people think of you, and they're generally not thinking of you because they're thinking of themselves. But we do. We walk into spaces. I'm 55 years of age, and I still walk into spaces, and I'm worried what people think. Right? We worry about the weather. We worry about what people think. We worry about whether we're going to be on time. Okay, some of you don't. <laughs> I'm so glad we're, 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 going to, we're going to Steamboat for the weekend So I'm just, we're not, whatever happens I'm not answering my phone tomorrow So it doesn't matter what I say today <laughs> But we worry about our futures We worry about our kids' futures We worry about tests we haven't taken Years ago I was in this restaurant I was eating lunch And this guy comes over and he goes Hey Hey, you're the new youth pastor at Canyon View, right? And I was a youth pastor there for 15 years. I did youth ministry for 22 years. And I said, yeah. He goes, hey, man, would you be praying for me this week? I got a test I got to take. And I said, oh, well, did you study? He goes, oh, dude, it's not that kind of test. You'll get the joke in a minute. <laughs> and I said, I don't know if I can pray for you for that. But we worry about our jobs. We worry about the news. We worry about what we're going to have for lunch. I just, we, like, in humanity, we have this space where we just constantly give ourselves to worry. In 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter writes to the church, he says, Give all your worries and cares to God, because you know he cares for you. Like today, if you're worrying, if you're worrying, like, give all your cares to God because he cares for you. Here, here's the sermon inside the sermon. Let me give you three ways that 
God will set you free from worry. First, my faith should remind me that God's guiding me. You guys realize that as believers in Jesus, that makes us people of faith. We're people of faith. Like we're people of faith. Like, like we believe that God speaks to us. Now I got to tell you, not everybody believes that. We believe that God leads us. Like God speaks to us and God leads us and God guides us. Like we believe that if we pray that God will give us direction from heaven. You do understand that that requires faith. Some people I've had conversations with here lately, and they're just like, but you, like, you believe that God speaks to you. Yeah, I do. And you're like, but it's not just because I believe it. It's also because I've experienced it. Like, my faith isn't based in, like, hope. My faith is, ex is, is based in experience. You see, the reason that God can set me free from worry is because my faith is also something I experience. When you're full of faith, you look for God's faithfulness. Like, this is the part about faith. When you're full of faith, you look for God's faithfulness. You see, the old saying, I don't know if you remember this saying, but I remember this saying as a kid. I don't know the future, but I know who holds it. I, I, don't, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. You see, here's the second piece about faith. My faith assures me that God will give me the strength to handle whatever burden I have to carry. That, I don't know about you, but that's good news. My faith tells me that whatever circumstance I have, I will be able to endure because I know the one that will help me endure it. Yeah, amen. Like, literally, amen. Like, the, this, this peace that, that faith calls us to. Timothy Keller said it this way. He was a Presbyterian pastor who passed away just last year. He said, if I knew what God knew, I would do what God says. If I knew what God knew, when, when I pray for direction, if I knew what God knew, I would do as God determines. Right now, at this very moment, Mark Melnick, who has been doing children up at VCC, he's teaching for Kevin and Missy. Kevin and Missy are... Uh, in Kansas City today, celebrating Thanksgiving with their family. And I asked him to come in. I said, I said I'd love to hear what you're teaching this week. And he said, I'm going to teach on the faithfulness of God. I said, I love that because I'm going to teach on the faithfulness of God. And he says, he says, uh, he says you know, it's going to be a hard Sunday. We're going to talk about the changes going on in VCC. He says, but I believe that God has put me at the very right moment for the very right conversation. Because the, what happens when you get ready to go through circumstance, you're like, I wonder if this is good. In January, he, his wife was, um, uh, on January 3rd, he found out that him and his wife were pregnant and they celebrated that. On January uh, 5th, she ended up, run, in, ended up in the hospital because she was so sick. And, and as, as they were um, talking about how dehydrated she was and how pregnant she was and how, how sick she was, they said, you do know that this much sickness is the result of twins. They find out that they have twins January uh, 4th, January 5th. January 8th, he loses his job. And he's looking up and he's going, God, like, we're going to have twins. I need a job. And she's so sick that he can't go back to work. In the middle of that process, that not only does he lose his job, but they also come across an inheritance that their family inherits. And the previous two years, the Lord had been telling him, I want you to store up. I want you to put money away. I want you to store up the storehouse. And he had no idea what it was about. But all this year, he hasn't been able to work. Earlier this summer, after the twins were born, two baby boys who were born as preemies. And his oldest son had to be flight for life to Denver to Children's Hospital. They just got the bill. The bill is over $500,000. 
but for the year, his family has made less than $18,000. And when they got the bill, the letter, read, letter just read, paid in full. And so he's literally talking today about not this idea of faithfulness, but how he's seen God's faithfulness show up even before he knew what he was going to go through. You see, my faith assures me that God will give me the strength to handle whatever burden I have to carry. Two passages out of Corinthians, one out of 1 Corinthians 10 and the second out of 2 Corinthians 12, the first one says, the temptations in this life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptations to be more than you can stand. And when you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure underneath it. Some of you this morning need to hear that passage. That as you are in situations that feel like they're more than you can stand, God has promised that he will help you endure those moments. 2 Corinthians 12 says, My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. You see, some of you need to hear that passage. That right now, whatever you're going through, it is a perfect time to just say, God, I need you. Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm weak. I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this situation. I don't know how I'm going to resolve this situation. But I trust that you have the power to get me through. You see, here's the third thing that I think that happens with our faith. I think my faith reassures me that God will be with me so I'm not alone. During these seasons that I call friend and family seasons, some of these seasons are the hardest seasons for people who are single. These particular seasons can be isolating. And what I want to say to you this season is I want you to remember that God has a plan for your life. Scripture, all through Scripture, talks, God, um, Scripture talks about the plans for our lives, that, that, you're, that you're not a mistake and you're not an accident. Jesus thought it was so important that we would know that he has a plan for our life, that the very last thing that he told the disciples before he ascended to heaven was, go wait on, on the Holy Spirit because I am going to send you a helper so that you're not alone. I'm going to send you my presence, that the Holy Spirit's going to dwell with you in such a way that he will lead you and guide you and bring you comfort and give you direction. Scripture literally calls the Holy Spirit the great comforter. And see, these seasons of the holidays for many people are really, really tough seasons. And I'd say it's a really good time to be connected to the church. That's why when I first started off, I said, hey, come on, let's, let's greet each other a little better. You see, church shouldn't be about just you. That during this season when we come to church, I'm asking that you would be very aware of others. That you would stop for a minute and get to know each other. That you would pause for a minute to engage each other. Would you would ask questions about one another. And maybe, just maybe, you would be even willing to invite people to go to lunch that you don't even know. Because you don't even know what they may be going through. And this is a great time for the church to be the church, to be the community, the ecclesia, the coming out, the, the body of Christ. You see, I believe that this morning, if that's the season you're in, that it's a great reminder that your faith, let your faith take over when your feelings of loneliness are driving you. Let your faith be what you rely on this season. And that you would look that God, that God would speak to you. Here's my last three points. I'm going to make them fast. Because I think all of them are important. And then I'm going to call the worship team to come back up. I just saw Cammie's face when I said I had three more points. It dropped like, oh my gosh, we're going to be here forever. You see, here's the other part of my faith. My faith is the place that becomes my foundation. You know, we live in a world that's changing, don't we? Like, 
They say one, one day they believe this, and the next day they try to get you to believe this. And what happens for us in Christ is that Paul says that it's our faith that is our foundation. Every religion in the world requires you to do something except Christianity. Christianity is the only religion in the world that requires you to believe something. That just says, just says, believe in me. Believe in me. That every religion in the world says, stop doing this or start doing that or stop eating this food and start eating that food. Stop hanging out with those people and start hanging out with these people. Christianity is the only place that says, why don't you just come as you are? He says in verses, um, Philippians 3, verse 3, he says, we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We need to put no efforts, no hope, no confidence in our human efforts. Here's the great part about this morning. There's nothing you have to do except believe in Christ Jesus. Nothing you have to do. I'm full of faith because of his faithfulness. The third thing is that my faith is set free, and I don't have to have false confidence or false expectations. You know, the hard part about um, friends and family is oftentimes when you gather with them, they have these expectations on you that you'll never meet. Okay, like only like four people. That's not true. You got family coming in. He's like, oh, I love that my mom's going to be here, but my gosh, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to live up to her expectations. Or maybe your dad. Or maybe your friends. Like, the great part about Jesus is you don't have to pretend to be anybody other than who you are. You, you don't have to walk in false expectations. Paul says in verse 5, he says, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure blood citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. And I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them all worthless. Faith in Jesus doesn't have anything to do with self-confidence. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. You see, here's the fourth thing. It's your faith that helps you to be faithful. Paul says in verse 4, he says, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's ways of making us right depend upon my faith. My faith is fully dependent upon his faithfulness. I'm going to invite our worship team to come back up. As they come up, here's the part that I'm hoping that you get out of this morning. That as we, con as we continue in this season, as we continue in Philippians, that this morning and we go into Thanksgiving and we think about the people that we're thankful for and we have moments of gratitude where we literally can pause and just stop in our day and we can pray and we can say, God, thank you for all the things you've given me. Thankful for all, that you're good in all seasons. That literally my hope is this today, <clears throat> is that God's faithfulness increases your faith. And as you increase your faith, that you would increase your faithfulness. You see, Paul writes at the very end of this, at the very end of this passage. He says, I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection for which Christ Jesus possessed me. He says, no, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on the one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which Christ Jesus is calling us. And here's what I love about the gospel. I would bet in this room, there's probably not one person that would say, I have become exactly who I was wanting to be. There's always a place that goes, man, I just wish I didn't do that, or I wish I'm still working on that. And I would say, I may not be who I want to be. And Paul's saying, I may not be who I want to be. But he's saying, I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I used to be. He, he's saying, I'm not who I used to be.
And one day, I will get to be where he promised the gift of eternal life to me. We get to come as we are. Whatever, whatever God's doing in your life this morning. Like, you don't have to pretend to be anybody other than who you are. And you just get to say, Lord, thank you. Lord, I'm grateful for you. And you get to offer the Lord your faithfulness today. And so we're going to sing a couple songs. And would you stand with me as we do that? So good, every breath that I make, I will sing the goodness of God. Your voice led me through the fire, darkest night. You've been close like no other. All my life you have been so, so good. Every breath that I live, oh, I will sing the goodness of God. Your is running out, running Running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. But my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after.
Take place. Feel the warmth through your embrace. Help me find the way. Bring me back to you. You know, this is what I love about the gospel. Is that we get to come as we are, but we don't have to stay as we are. Like the gospel transforms lives. The gospel redeems and restores. I, I think the next month is probably one of the most important seasons that we get every year. And the reason why is this. I mean, it, there's, there's plenty of opportunities. It's not like we lack opportunities. But tonight, tonight we have a worship service over at Canyon View. All the Vineyard churches, all the Vineyard family, we're going to join in one place, and we're going to worship for the next hour and 15 minutes. It's a great opportunity to invite friends and family. It's a great space in that moment. And the, re the reason why is because we know that when we show up in these places, that God transforms lives. Christmas Eve. It's going to be a great service. It's a great opportunity to invite friends and family. It's a great space. Like, we should come into this season and we should be saying, hey, do you guys want to come to church with me this weekend? Because what we know is this, is that when people get in God's presence, that God transforms lives. Even this morning, I'd say today's a great opportunity. That you would let the Lord transform your life, that that when, when we come into these spaces and we sing these songs, that you're all I want, you're all I've ever needed. Those aren't just words. Like, those are prayers. When we look at the candles right now, we get to see prayers. And so I'd say this, that if you would allow me, if you would just bow your head with me, and if you have not given your life to Jesus, that today you would just say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, I need you to lead and guide me and direct me. Or maybe you know that you're living a life right now where you're not asking and you're not allowing the Lord to lead and guide you and direct you. And maybe if that's you, maybe you just say, Lord, I, I need to give you back my life. 
that you would lead me and you would guide me and you would direct me. If you're in either one of those categories and you would be willing to just put up your hand, would you just put up your hand so I can know who I'm praying for? Yeah. Thank you for that honesty. Thank you for that. The Lord rewards our faith with faithfulness. So Lord, right now, I just ask that you would be with my friends and my family. And that Lord, that you would, as they raise their hands to say, Lord, I need you. You're all I need. You're all I've ever wanted. Lord, would you come into their life in such a way that you would take them where they are and you would do a work in them that would move them to the space and the place where you want them to be. Redeem their lives. Lord, and for my friends and my family that are struggling this season of just that space of saying, Lord, this is a hard season for me. I ask that you would meet us. Meet us in these spaces. Be the comforter that you promise. Lead and guide and direct. And that we would know that we're never alone. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. The whole church said, Amen. Amen. Happy Thanksgiving. May the Lord bless you.